the time to read through that document. So, firstly, um, Councillor Cannon, can I just thank you for um, issuing that document? Um, no doubt um, members have, have had um, some time to read it, um, and I'm sure that when they come to their conclusions, they will take those recommendations into account. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Councillor Cannon before we move on? No. Okay, can we have the decision taker please, Councillor Chris Jones? Thank you, Chair. Um, as Cabinet Member for Adult Care and Health for Women, it's my job to make sure we have the best possible services for our most vulnerable residents, which is almost an impossible job as central government continues to slash our budgets year on year. I care about that job, about doing it well, and I care about the NHS. I'm a nurse and I've worked in the NHS for 40 years. Pooling budgets for the CCG is about providing a better service as demand grows. It's about making sure our vulnerable residents don't have to navigate the complex structures between various services and organisations. It's about making sure they have to tell their story just once to one care professional who will ensure their needs are met. It's about making our money go further, removing duplication and wasting effort and resources. It is not about privatisation of the NHS. To suggest that is, quite frankly, ludicrous. I'm a Labour politician and it's my party that created the NHS. It's our biggest and most celebrated achievement and the envy of the world. My ambition is to help the NHS become stronger. I want to take the challenges it is facing and find new ways to tackle them. The support from central government is lukewarm, to say the least, so we have to stand up for will on our residents. As long ago as the 1990s, Frank Dobson made the rallying cry to tear down the Berlin Wall between health and care. He didn't see why, if you saw a social care worker for part of your care and an NHS worker for, for the other part, often they were on the same day and often doing more or less the same thing and we're 20 years on now, and little has changed. Labour has a 10-year plan for health and care. The plan was developed to put right the inconsistencies of the 2012 Act and to reshape care for the 21st century. It describes a fra fragmented health and care system that isn't joined up. Social care services that have been neglected and underfunded. It says that low investment in care and staffing has led to a poorly skilled workforce. It talks about locally driven integration to turn that around. The plan indicates a focus on the viability of whole health and care systems, not on individual organisation, and the internal market where billions of pounds are wasted every year. What is incredibly important to remember in this debate, which I think has been missed in much of the rhetoric, which surrounds it, is that NHS and social care staff agree with integrated services. They are the experts, they know what their patients need and want, and they say that integration is the only way to ensure that improvement in the services which people receive. They no longer have to argue whether a person needs a health bath or a social care bath, it's a bath. To do this, we need to join up the money as well as the staff and resources. The most recent consultation on integration was the All Age Disability Service. People were asked, do you think joining social care and health colleagues within one organisation will improve the service? And almost 70% said yes. The legal arrangements under the Section 75 are there because the finances have to come together if we are truly going to join up services. 
Social workers ordering care packages and now working truly alongside their nursing colleagues. We have had a Section 75 agreement for the Better Care Fund for several years. Without this, the Council would lose tens of millions of pounds of funding for services offered free at the point of delivery to vulnerable people coming out of hospital or in their community would not be able to, to legally run or alternatively we would have to impose charges on people as they could no longer be considered joint health and care services. For people with disabilities, the pooling of resources is allowing joined up planning that is helping people out of long stay hospital and receive properly joined up care. This would also be at risk. The Section 75 is not a tool for privatisation, but a tool for ensuring that health and care are working in a collaborative and joined up way. I'm proud of the way we have taken forward integration in Whittle and our clear focus on improving the way the system can work together to support people to tell their story once and to receive the right care in the right place at the right time. Thank you, Chair. Does anybody have any questions for Councillor Chris Jones? Chris, I, I hear what you're saying um, regarding the NHS and so forth, and we totally agree with all that. Uh, well, I totally agree with all that. Um, what I'm very concerned about as a, as a scrutiny member of adult health is documentation. Um, that wasn't given to us, the due diligence documents, Price Waterhouse due diligence documents, has not been available to our scrutiny committee to fully scrutinise. It wasn't released, it wasn't um, released until the 6th of October. And I've been asking for this due diligence document and so have the Tories for over four or five months and it hasn't been forthcoming. And I don't feel we can um, move forward but we need to have that document to be able to scrutinise. We have got it now, but we haven't had a chance to scrutinise it. Um, do you think we should be able to have to scrutinise that document? Because when I asked the council officer, um, the council officer actually told me that um, you know it wasn't you know it wasn't up to us to scrutinise that. And that is a key document. It's a due diligence document that actually tells us what the due diligence process was regarding whether this trial the Section 75 agreement and the integrated health arrangements are a better service for the people of Wirral. So without scrutinising that document, I have got real concerns regarding the Council signing the Can Section 75 agreement. Any questions, please, Tony? Start on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do appreciate what you're saying, Councillor Norbury. Uh, I think the, the PwC report originally was when we intended to pull an awful lot more together. Um, and if you have a look at the, the documents at the back of the report, it shows how we've mitigated those risks. Um, I do appreciate you've been asking about it, but you've got every opportunity now to, to scrutinise the report. Councillor Jones made uh, a passionate historic account of things that have happened since 1948, when at the time care and health went on different paths for various <coughs> reasons. Uh, what we're trying to do, and she quite rightly referred to the people that we're trying to serve who would be needing nursing or other services, that members understand what members have concerns about, as I understand it, are the democratic accountability of these arrangements. And I wonder if Councillor Jones could elaborate how she sees the relationship between the Joint Strategic Commission Board and the Council. Um, I think that we have now got the biggest chance to influence what um, is happening with CCG commissioning. Previously, we had no opportunity at all to, to get involved. The committee is a committee in common, so we meet at the same time, but we actually vote separately. But the CCG and the council have one vote each. 
So we actually, I think, it's far more democratically driven now than, than it's ever been. Just to, just to ask you another question on the, the, the one vote each. So, you know, the democratic accountability of, of signing the Section 75 agreement, you say we have one vote each, who has the deciding vote? There isn't a deciding vote, and if it's not unanimous, it doesn't get passed. Chris, could I just ask you a question, please, just so that I'm clear. Um, if we don't sign, if, if you know, if this, um, if, if we decide that we need to take back to council or we need to take this back to cabinet, um, what does that mean to an older person who's lying in a hospital bed, um, either wanting to get back to full-time care or wanting to get back home? Will it have an impact and what will that impact be? It will have a huge impact because we're talking about millions of pounds. Um, what it means at the moment is that really joined up working gets care packages sorted out very quickly to get people out of hospital or in fact to prevent people going into hospital. Um, but some people would be charged as well because at the moment the packages would be free because they're classed as joint um, health and, and care. Whereas if they're only social care, people get charged. Councillor Kruby first, and then um, Councillor Christine Spriggs. Some of my questions have actually been asked uh, and answered uh, by Mr. Gilchrist about accountability. Um, it's a bit of a weird situation that we're sitting here at the end of the table as children because we can't, <coughs> can't vote, which is ridiculous. So I think we need to change the constitution on that. Um, my question is about accountability as well because with the CCG, when they wanted to close our walking centre in Eastern, it was a case of it seems to be again that we're doing it to the people of Willow, not with the consent of the people of Willow. So my concerns are that as a councillor, I've had no input into this. I know it's gone to cabinet and the other ruling party, but we don't. Have, it goes out as council has approved this. And as a councillor, I've had no input into it whatsoever. So it's been approved by cabinet, so the three people on that board, but the rest of us as councillors don't get a say. So how can it possibly be be accountable as councillors to something we've had no input in? Can I say as members of scrutiny, you can ask to scrutinise absolutely anything. You need to speak to your chair and how did you work for? Well, okay, I'll leave that one. Um, Councillor Mosprat. Sorry, Councillor Mosprat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got uh, two questions. First of all, on the question of accountability, um, the one vote um, is it decided by the three people who are there at that time or is it taken back and the CCG one vote is it decided there or is theirs taken back and has to be ratified um, because that's slightly different than what you said and on the second thing were we not in a meeting I seem to remember with uh, Graham where he said that by um, <coughs> holding hard a little bit on, on signing the section 75 um, wouldn't actually have any major uh, problems in the sort of short to medium term. I think you were in that meeting, Chris. Well, I think Graham is, is one of the witnesses, so you can ask him that. Um, Voting-wise, yes, you know that very well that, that we did, the three councillors do vote at the time. The um, CCG members vote and then they take it back as a recommendation to their committee. Can you tell me then, so the decision isn't made there, is it? If it has to be taken back. So you've got three people who make a decision, and then, for well, one vote, and then however many, I don't know how many, make a decision that's then taken away. Is that right? So there is, there is some consultation on one side, but not on the other side. Is that right? It, we do make our decision at the time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Just been alluded to by uh, Christina, the, the question that you asked, if I can rephrase that. 
in the immediate future, if we were to postpone the decision on the sand list, what would be the impact on the people of Liverpool? Immediate, not in the mid term or the long term, but in the immediate. If we need time to further scrutinise this, what would be the immediate impact? It would have massive implications for people's care packages. Uh, just to follow up on that question about the impact on care packages, surely it would have an impact on patient flow to the health hospital. So we're, especially as we come up to the busy winter period, we'd be finally ending up with more ambulances queuing up outside AME. Yeah. Yes, it would. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jones. If there are no more questions, I am I'm going to ask our first calling witness, which is Dr. Derek Timmons. Sorry, Mr. Timmons, Dr. Timmons, could you just um, explain for those of us that um, don't know you um, exactly what your role is? And yes, um, your background, please. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you for inviting me to address you all today. Um, uh, I'm a retired um, GP. I was a principal in general practice many years ago, and also um, I was a police clinical forensic examiner and a retired consultant physician. Um, I'm here today really to elaborate on my concerns and on the process that's been used and the outcome in terms of this Section 75. Um, Agreement. So, if I may, I can read it from what I've my brief. I gather I've got five minutes now, Julie. Thank you very much. It is my belief, and that of many other independent experts, that the recent signing by Wirral Council of the Section 75 contract with Wirral CCG is against the public interest. Numerous authoritative and expert sources, including MPs, locally and nationally, advise against this signing, but this expert advice was ignored. In the opinion of many, this was a breach of duty of care. Officers and councillors bear responsibility and accountability. The signing also contravenes extant Labour Party policy. The Section 75 contract involves the pooling of CCG and council budgets for health and social care. We're all CCG is in serious deficit currently of approximately £19 million, and I understand also in special measures. Much of social care is already privatised. This raises a serious issues as to how these budgets will be managed, the inherent risks, political and financial, control and who will be the winners and losers. This has been inadequately thought through. There are also the issues of competencies, intentionality and insight. Next, crucially, there is a serious lack of real terms democratic accountability and the new board that is set up will operate at arm's length from the rural public. The three councillors on this board do not appear to have a legal power of veto nor ready access to walking easily away from this contract if needs be. Furthermore, there appears to have been no fit for purpose public consultation and engagement about what is a major change, and in our view, this is potentially unlawful. Next, we turn to the critical matter of fixed allocated budgets. Importantly, these are not based on actual clinical need, but on rigid requirement to balance budgets. This will mean huge cuts, denial and delays in care and services, and likely co-payments and inadequate personal budgets. Of sinister import is the rebranding by, the, by NHS England of the infamous accountable care systems and organisations and the sustainability and transformation plans into integrated care. Now that is presented to the unwary and misinformed as so-called improved integrated care with place-based care and neighbourhood care, all unproven models in real terms. These could be straight out of the playbook of Greek mythology and are deceptive Trojan horses that will lead to further privatisation and Americanisation of our precious public NHS. Please do not be fooled, caveat emptor. Integrated care has always been done for necessity by healthcare professionals. It is apparent that it is currently being used to deliberately mislead those who are insufficiently cautious, expert and informed. 
under new appropriate primary legislation protected to NHS and not disrupted to it, enhancing integrated care would make more sense. To do this does not need the pooling of budgets. It does not make any sense under the current pernicious legal framework. The current plan is in fact all about changing structures to make them right for corporate takeovers, privatisations and reducing budgets. Moving on, there is an absence of real terms independent expert advice on the CCG Council Joint Board to support and advise the three-day councillors. Where are the independent medically qualified and public health experts and other outside independent experts as often seen in other regions? This is not personal, but with respect to so many of the world public have now completely lost trust and confidence in the responsible councillors and officers. In summary, many independent experts would view the signing of this Section 75 contract under the current legal framework of the Health and Social Care Act 2012 and Health and Social Care Act 2006 as unnecessary, a very serious error, and wholly against the public interest, and which will lead to increasing privatisation of our NHS, cuts in services, and more denials and delays in health and social care. It appears members have been deliberately hoodwinked and that the result is incautious, very risky, and wholly against the public interests. The new planned NHS contract from the 1st of April 19 will further cement these ominous changes unless stopped by the recent Court of Appeal judgment, which will be due soon, perhaps before Christmas or in the new year. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Can I just ask you to stay there for a moment to case three questions? Do, um, do any of you have any questions? Councillor Hi, Derek. Just a, a question on uh, accountability. So, what, what, what controls does the CCG have to carry on with a decision that they have made? Because we, you know, we're, we're, we've been scrutinising some of the decision-making processes. And there's one vote it, 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 it sounds quite complicated. Um, the decision making process, some can come back and consult, some can't come back and consult. But I've seen an, an example of the CCG where our scrutiny committee has tried to hold them to account uh, regarding the consultation on the urgent care and I believe some, there's, there's, there's urgent care measures in the signing of the section 75 through what I understand. Just, just, just coming to the question because urgent care is, is included in this. Um, and when we try to hold the CCG to account regarding urgent care, they completely ignored the recommendations of the scrutiny committee and carried on with the consultation as it was. So I've got grave concerns because I've seen the CCG in practice um, when it comes to accountability and democracy. Um, can you elaborate on the control mechanisms that we would have as a democratically elected council to control the decisions that the CCJ would make? Well, as I see it, uh, the, NH the NHS England is the directing body for the CCGs. They take their orders, their mandates from NHS England, which is a banker, uh, but which reports to the Secretary of State for Health. One of my major concerns, and I've briefly alluded to in this five minutes, is the lack of real terms, democratic accountability, and as other councillors have mentioned here, about their involvement in terms of the democratic accountability process. And I think the current arrangement under this PWC document does not satisfy those requirements at all. Um, and as a councillor, if I was sitting on this joint board, I would have grave concerns that I wasn't able to properly and duly represent my constituents in terms of that process. You also raised the issue of the urgent care centre, which I know we're not directly discussing today, but there is relevance here. Because there seems to be an inherent paradox in the way the CCG, and this is with respect, is behaving with regard to the urgent care changes. The council have rightly come up only against them. And the fact that you're actually working in close cooperation with them on this other element, and it doesn't make sense when they're behaving in one modus operandi uh, in one situation and in another modus operandi in another, my fear and the experience in Manchester indeed has been that highly acrimonious relations result between the CCG members and the councillors um, because of these structures, because there's a, a divergence of really what the uh, commitments and what the intentions are of the two parties. So I think it's, it's a very perplexing arrangement and I do not think 
with my legal hat and my medical hat and my business hat, I'm also an MBA, that it's actually being thought through correctly. Thank you, Mr. Timms, Thank you, Chair. I have been following this discussion about Americanisation, and what reading I've been able to do really flows from a report of the House of Commons Library did a briefing paper in July on accountable care organisations. And in that, they referred to the report of the Health and Social Care Committee called Integrated Care Organisations, Partnerships and Systems. I wonder if you've had a chance to read the House of Commons. I have, yes. And yes. Based on their view, you appear to have diverged from some of their conclusions. So you don't mind if I just explore that for a minute? Yeah, that's okay, yeah. I'd yeah. like to chair Mr. Timmins' comment on their conclusion was that, well, there were several. Some campaigns against privatisation confuse issues around integration. Concerns expressed about the Americanisation of the NHS are misleading. And then they talk about the STP process. So can you comment on that assertion? From yeah, that paper was reviewed and there was a considerable um, expert input into not agreeing with many of its conclusions. I'm a member of the Socialist Health Association that has over nearly a thousand members, many of them retired professors and academics and doctors and so on. Um, and so we didn't entirely agree that, but if I just give you some history, the, the concept of the Accountable Care Organisation came in 2006 from a, a doctor called Elliot Fisher, who worked in public health, and the idea was that you would actually um, reduce costs, uh, but at the same time improve the quality of care. And this was, uh, a dis this was necessary because the escalating budgets uh, and I think you're all aware of the huge amount spent in America and the fact that so many do not get care, were not being managed. And so this idea of um, uh, having an accountable care organisation was, was, was put out. But in fact, it's been shown to have failed on many fronts. And it seems that we're just importing this American model straight out of the playbook into the UK. Integrated care, I think, has been a rebadging of um, these accountable care systems and um, the uh, um, sort of accountable care systems really to fool people into thinking that they're getting something different. So if you speak to my, my American colleagues, they have major concerns with, about the way the accountable care system works in the US. We're importing it here and the House of Commons report, I don't know who actually produced it, but I did speak to my MP about it and there was considerable concern that it had drawn some of the wrong conclusions. Well, it's just the available evidence if you read the various press articles and the papers that have been written and eminent societies and organisations and other expert evidence and MP views that they seem to be at variance to what the conclusions have been of the committee when it was agreed. So that gives an impression that they've been misled. really and, and, and what you said. I, I do feel I've been hoodwinked because I haven't had the proper information to scrutinise. I haven't had the documentation available to scrutinise. Thank you. It's questions we're looking for rather than statements. I did outline Can I just pick up on that thing, Chair, please? I do agree with you. And the document that is being produced um, that underpins this of due diligence is a complex document that has a lot of legal terminology in it which non-legal persons would un not understand. I completely sympathise with you that you were not given timely exposure to this document. Um, and I also wonder whether the law officers have actually produced a lay report 
to translate the legal terminology in that and provided that to all councillors. I don't know whether that's the case or not. Um, it was not something that could be done easily or quickly. 
um, and the final contract for very little relation to the model contract, which I've noticed reading through the, um, the Wirral contract, by and large it's a model contract that the NHSE produced, although not entirely, of course. Um, anyway, the final position that we achieved in Manchester was that um, the council had absolute equality on the board. There are three elected members um, on the board of the partnership, and the elected members have a veto on all decisions. It's not a veto they yet have to use, um, but they do have a veto um, on the basis that the uh, accountability, the democratic accountability, um, has been maintained. One of my concerns was, again, looking at the Wirral contract, which I was asked to do, um, was that um, most of the power um, and most of the decision-making appears to be in the hands of the CCG. Um, I don't know here if, in Wirral if the golden chair, when you um, transferred your housing stock out of council authority, whether the golden chair was retained, it was in Manchester and many other places, and that was the example that we used. That's why we said we have to keep having the veto. The council must have the golden chair. There's a democratic imperative here. We also had to, as officers, um, design a contract that was going to protect Manchester City Council in respect of statutory duties, um, or so that that would avoid the risk that the City Council could be brought in front of the local government ombudsman, that it could be held up for judicial review, that safeguarding uh, arrangements were adequate because clearly they cannot be devolved under the Section 75. Safeguarding arrangements still sit with the Director of Adult Social Services and local members. And one of the things that I did was develop a QA system, a very complex and um, rigorous QA system, so that um, the DAS and members could be assured of uh, safeguarding practice um, within the partnership. We also developed a system to ensure that resource allocation system uh, decisions were all taken by city council employees, not by health employees. We have to protect the city council budget. Um, clearly, uh, local authorities don't need to remind you of the necessity to produce a legal budget, to abide by a legal budget. Clearly, um, colleagues in, in health don't necessarily have that same imperative. Thank you, Mrs. Nolan. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Can, uh, if you wouldn't mind remaining there, just so that we can see if, if members have any questions, I'm going to take Christine Lospratt and then um, Joe Walsh. Thank you, um, you, you touched on um, accountability. Um, what, what, what would we do um, about democratic accountability? Well, that, that's not for me to advise the local authority what, what it should do. I can only tell you what, um, as officers, we were asked to negotiate um, for the contract in Manchester. And that was about maintaining um, the position that the elected members would be ultimately the people who were able to take those decisions so that they did have that ultimate right of veto um, on the board and that also um, in terms of that accountability for our statutory duties and for, um, for budgetary decisions remained within the power of the local authority wasn't to say that didn't want the partnership working, the close working, and the integrated in commas working. And there was a called budget, um, there was a called system there, but it still had to, the council still had to be able to have that control um, over the, the, the spending of, of the council's budget. That was the absolutely vital part. And that would be the bit that would worry me, having read this contract, that I'm not convinced that there is that total control for the council. And that's something that your officers should be instructed to negotiate, as I was in Manchester. Thank you, Thank you for that. Just on the agreement itself, this section 75, it says here it can be cancelled in three months, but it could take up to 15 years to cancel. Now, it seems to have heard that the um, CCT are 19 million in deficit. Wouldn't that set alarm bells in the yeah? It would, and that was, I think, one of the things that I said at the start. As 
with my senior officer head on. That would have been something that I would have been flagging up as a matter of urgency to members. As I say, that wasn't the position in Manchester, but the opposite position where they were giving us, they were giving the council money. Um, but certainly that's something I would be flagging up as a serious concern for members. Councillor Kruger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Joe. You just asked my question. <laughs> I was going to ask the, uh, the question I was going to ask is you did mention that the CCG and, and stuff in Manchester was uh, affluent, should we say? Yeah. Um, and the CCG is a deficit of 19 million. Um, and is in special measures. I was going to ask the question was uh, what would be the impact of the decisions made and how would it have been different in Manchester if that was the case in Manchester? I can't speak for the decisions that the elected members would have made. I can only tell you what my advice would have been. And my advice would have been that pooling of budgets should not have been proceeded with at that point. Certainly, the coming together of services is absolutely vital, and that's really important, and it's absolutely a benefit to everybody um, involved, both people receiving services and staff, that everybody should work more closely together. But I would have been advising um, caution, and I'm absolutely sure that our 151 officer would have been advising caution as well. But that's that's purely what would have gone on there. I can't speak for the right course of action people here in Wales. Did, did you want to come back? Councilor? I did. It's gone. Thank you. While I hear what you say about the, the process that Manchester went through, and it was a lot longer process and more detailed, more checks and balances, which is obviously a good thing, um, the end result, um, we're both aiming for the same goal, I believe, um, and that is to provide a better service for, for the, uh, the residents um, at a cheaper cost. Um, I take it that that has been uh, has been uh, obtained within Manchester since they since this agreement. Um, would if that's the case, do you view it as privatisation, or do you view it as uh, something different from privatisation in as much as of the way that it's been implemented in Manchester compared to the way uh, we're, we're looking at implementing it within Whittle? No, I don't give it. Thank you. Um, no, it's not privatisation per se. Um, what it does do is make it easier in many ways for the service to be privatised should anybody at some point in the future wish to go down that route. Um, and having a, uh, an integrated pooled budget service that operates with a single management structure and a single service makes that much easier for private organisations to cherry pick it. But the short answer to your question is no. Neither of the proposals per se are privatisation, but they do pave the way. Thank you. Councillor Kruger, if you remember what you... I do. You, I do. You, well, you remember it now. Uh, my question was going to be quite a quick one. Uh, considering this is being done in Manchester, is it, you, in your experience then, is it absolutely necessary to provide the service by having to definitely pool the resources, financial resources, or can it be done without that being done? My view is that it can be done without it being done. Okay. Um, we did it in Manchester because they were putting a lot of money into the yeah. local authority, which was helpful, but it wasn't essential. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 